We've seen the devastating impacts that water buybacks have. Those policies are all very much reflective in this new government's uh, agreements. So without asking me my opinion or knowing anything about me, they immediately made an assumption and just started swearing at me, getting increasingly hostile, which is when my cameraman and I decided to leave. In the now famous words of James Carville, advisor to then presidential candidate Bill Clinton, it's the economy, stupid. The economy is to us like water is to a fish. It's all around us all the time and when everything's going well, it's very easy to ignore. It's only when it starts to go wrong that you even realise that it's there. I remember in the lead up to the 2007 federal election, the one where Kevin Rudd won, a friend of mine who happens to be a raging lefty from the arts scene was objecting to the then Prime Minister John Howard's campaign. Howard was campaigning on his economic record, the fact that the country was debt free and that opportunity abounded. My lefty friend objected and said that there's more to life than the economy. My reply, that's easy to say when the economy is good. But when the economy goes bad... That's when you realise that, in the words of James Carville, it's the economy, stupid. And there's no question that our economy has started to go bad. I've spoken at length about the fact that there's nothing magical about Australia, that if we make the same bad choices that other countries have made, then we'll get the same bad consequences. We're not immune to the consequences of our actions. And sadly, we're seeing proof of that now. In Venezuela, one of the world's worst basket cases, more than 40% of Venezuelans are now malnourished. In Argentina, which has suffered under a big socialist government of one form or another for decades, more than 40% of people are in poverty. In Australia, where we thought we could spend our way back into prosperity and it would never come back to bite us, more than 40% of households are now cutting back on their food spending due to a shortage of money. Food banks and charities are inundated with people needing the most basic staples to get by. And these are no longer just homeless or unemployed people. These are often working people, people with families, sometimes even double income families, whose month is still going when their paycheck has long run out. The evidence is everywhere. People are delaying medical appointments, not taking taking prescription medication, not taking out insurance on their cars or homes. And speaking of homes, working people can no longer afford to live anywhere near where they work. According to Anglicare, nurses can only afford perhaps 1.5% of all of the rental houses on the rental market, forcing them into share housing or other undesirable arrangements due to financial hardship. It doesn't have to be this way. There's a common belief that your home is the most expensive thing that you'll buy in your lifetime. It's the thing that costs you the most every year, whether in rent or in mortgage payments. But that's simply not true. The most expensive thing that you pay for every year is your government. And I think it's high time we started to talk about it. Government borrowing and spending is the elephant in the room that no one seems to want to talk about. The RBA is blaming inflation and people spending on haircuts and dentists as the problem, as though somehow... Basic hygiene is responsible for inflation. Others are blaming the boomers, those dastardly boomers that have invested, worked and saved all their lives and now they're just trying to enjoy their money in their retirement. How dare they? But of course, all of that is just divide and conquer strategies designed to make sure that we never recognise the real problem, the one that is literally staring us in the face. It's the cost of government, stupid. I first covered this problem 10 years ago in a video titled The Forbidden History of Terrible Taxes. In that video, I added up all of the visible taxes like income tax and GST, plus the less visible ones like payroll and stamp duty, plus other fees and charges that we pay or which businesses pay and then charge us for in the shelf price. And the startling conclusion was that, well, here's me from 10 years ago to explain it to you. It's important to ask just how much tax do we pay anyway? Just how much? That's a good question, and I'm glad you asked. The median Australian full-time wage is $54,750, of which you pay $9,340.75 in income tax, leaving you with $45,409.25 to pay your bills. And that's it, right? Tax is paid, the rest of your paycheck is yours. Except that it's not, because you also pay about $2,530.30 in GST every year. Then there's fuel excise, and of course we have to pay our council rates, and the same goes for stamp duty, and the list goes on. 
Already our median wage earner has paid over $17,000 per year towards the cost of government, but we're still not finished. If you want to know what the full cost of government is, then you have to include all the indirect taxes. These are taxes you don't see because they're paid by businesses, but they increase the cost of doing business, which is another way of saying that they increase the cost of everything you buy. And then of course there's all the red tape and regulation, the compliance costs, the millions of man hours spent by businesses every year filling out paperwork to keep bureaucrats happy, all of which is paid for in the end by you, the consumer. And let's not forget the businesses pay council rates, stamp duty, fuel excise, and all of that money, all of that cost of government goes straight into the shelf price of everything you buy. And then last, but sadly not least, we get to the cost of harebrained government schemes which have jacked up the price of electricity, water, healthcare, and just about everything else. They're not taxes, and they look like increases in the cost of living, but really we're paying for the stupid ideas of politicians and bureaucrats. Have you noticed your electricity bill jumping by 30, 50 or even 70% in just the last few years? Well, you can thank your government for most of that. It's government that we're paying for. It's impossible to put a final figure on exactly how much the government costs the median wage earner. But once you factor in the direct taxes, indirect taxes, excises, fees, tariffs, duties, business compliance costs, failed green schemes, industry subsidies and everything else, my best guess puts it at around $25,000 out of a median wage of just $54,750. The bit that's left is what you get to spend on the actual cost of living. Are you still wondering why it's so hard to make ends meet? That was me 10 years ago, but we've kept making the same mistakes and things have gotten worse since then. Reasonable estimates now put the cost of government for a median full-time worker at 50% or more of their income once absolutely everything is factored in. And that means that your employer has to pay you $80,000 just for you to have $40,000 that you can actually spend effectively. Starting to see the problem? And remember that the prices of everything you buy are jacked up thanks to government as well. So it's not just that you have less to spend, it's also that the things you need to buy are more expensive. Don't forget that your employer has to pay you double what you actually get in purchasing power, but their prices are set to recoup that higher cost, even though you don't see the benefit. The difference is being taken by government and you have to pay for it. And that's why working people who are getting paid are now struggling to make ends meet. The problem is the cost of government. But what matters now is that we need to get everyone around us to understand this problem too. Because it's true that we get the government we deserve. And that means that right now, we the people deserve a high taxing, high spending train wreck of a government that is taking us off a cliff. And if we want better government, we need to start by becoming better people and helping those around us to also understand that this crisis is not the cost of living, it's the cost of government, and it's up to us to fix it. Now here's the news. Well, here at the Aussie Wire, our objective is, of course, to take over the world. Why would we have any less of an objective than that? But sadly, that's something that I can't do on my own. So it's always been a part of our mission, a part of our vision to find, to employ and bring under the Aussie Wire umbrella to train and uh, to equip really talented people who can help carry us forward and in the process carry the alternative media forward, creating a genuine alternative to the dinosaur lamestream media that we've all abandoned long ago. And it gives me great pride and great pleasure to introduce to you the first of our new recruits. Very, very exciting day for us. We've only been going for six months, can you believe? And we've already reached this milestone, uh, courtesy of a lovely young lady who I get to introduce you to right now. Anna McGovern, how are you? Hello, I'm doing great, thank you. Welcome in the in the most literal sense. I, t I say to every guest, welcome to the Aussie Wire. But in, in your case, it's actually, it's a literal welcome to the Aussie Wire. Now, yeah, no, it's great to be here. No, I, I've honestly, I've always wanted to work for an outlet that promotes free speech, free thoughts, and goes against the grain on issues that the mainstream media wouldn't necessarily report on. So I'm so excited to join the team. Now, I'm just, I'm just, I'm detecting something here, and it's only because I have an incredibly keen sense of hearing that I'm just, I'm picking up. Most people would have missed it. I'm noticing an accent. Whereabouts are you from, and what brings you to Australia? So I'm from the UK, from London, 
And I'm here in Australia because it's something I've always wanted to do. My parents came over here over 10 years ago. And ever since I've been growing up, they've always been telling me, you'll love Australia, the way of life. It's all, it's uh, everything that you would love to experience, be a part of. Mm. So I knew for me, it's always something I, I had to do. So I decided to make the jump. I went for it. I moved over here in September and I've been loving it ever since. Now, you've actually been active. You've been on Sky News. You've been on a bunch of other sort of networks. Uh, so this this is not a new thing for you. You are interested in politics. You're commentating on politics. You're already out there doing this sort of thing. What made you do that? Most young people, you know, they're off partying, doing whatever, traveling the world. I mean, you are traveling the world. At least you're ticking that box. What drew you to <laughs> political commentary? So, yes, I was working for outlets such as Talk TV and GB News back in the UK, and I do independent content creation as well. Mm. I've, um, for me personally, I love just getting my voice heard. I have a background in charity and social action, so campaigning um, and helping out people and talking about the issues uh, that matter most, especially to young people, something, is something that I've always been incredibly passionate about. So that was a really, um, you know, for me, that was the segue where I initially got into politics because mm. I started volunteering in my local community, getting involved with my local council and seeing all of the local issues, particularly from uh, focusing on those issues uh, affecting young people in the community. That was my first initial interest in mm. politics. And for me, it's always about speaking up on issues that matter most to people and just getting voices heard. Yeah, fantastic. So you're going to be taking over the Aussie Wire's social media. So everyone watching, if you want to say hi to Anna, leave a comment in the uh, comment section of this video. She has to read them all anyway. It's her job now. Uh, so <laughs> so she'll, she'll reply and say hi to you, I'm sure. Now, Anna, you're in addition to taking care of our social media and uh, helping us to take the next step in being prolific and uh, and more, I guess, targeted on the different social media platforms. That's a young person's game. It's not my thing at all. Uh, so we're going to hand all of that over to you, but you're not going to be locked away from being on screen. You talked about the love of covering issues. Are there particular issues that are particularly close to your heart? So what, are the, what, what, what are some of the stories that you would, or the, the topics that you would instinctively gravitate towards? So for me personally, um, I'm very big on reporting on the issues concerning the culture war because I think it's something that we're really big in experiencing right now across the world. And this is something that I was doing predominantly in the UK. I think, for example, gender ideology is an increasing issue that's not only affecting, you know, us adults in the in the modern day world, but it's now actually coming into schools. We're seeing children now being introduced to this at a very young age. Mm. So for me, it's been about, you know, raising awareness on these issues i've been going to, um for example to posey parker's let women speak events yeah. every month in london which was a platform to raise awareness of women's stories um for their backgrounds and how gender ideology has had an impact on their lives and their children's lives as well so any issues concerning the culture war politics westminster and not trusting the government <laughs> i'm your go-to girl for that well i'm glad you said culture war because i honestly i i know it's important but i just don't want to cover it. I don't want to touch it. It just makes me too angry. Let me tell you a quick story. There's a young lady I want to introduce you to. She's uh, She lives not far from me. She's just graduated from high school and she nearly didn't. She nearly got kicked out of her school because she lost her temper over the fact that they were putting kitty litter into the ladies' toilet stalls. Now, I've heard, I've heard urban myths and rumours of this sort of thing happening because they have furries in the school, people who identify as animals. I've heard rumours of this, and then now finally I've actually met somebody, and she looked me in the eye and she said, I saw it, I was there, this actually happened. She nearly got herself kicked out of the school because she reacted, uh, as you can imagine, uh, with absolute disgust. So this sort of stuff is real and it's going on. It's very important to cover it. So I'm very, very happy to have you as part of the Aussie Wire team because I'd love you to be the one that introduces her, uh, sorry, that interviews that young lady because if I do it, I'm going to lose my temper. It's going to make me too cross and I'm going to be unprofessional and it's much, just much better if, uh, if you do that for us. Now, before we close out, you actually started work early. You were doing overtime before you even started. You just came on board. Literally this morning was when your contract began. Uh, but last weekend you were out there and covering. Well, tell us, before we show the video, tell us the event that you were covering. So in Newtown, Sydney, there was a big march taking place called the Trans Day of Resistance, which I just so happened to come across um, being advertised. So I decided to attend it with my cameraman just to see what was going on and what the trans activists were advocating for. They'd set up a Facebook group advocating for five core principles, and it was all about uh, trans rights. And for me, I just wanted to find out what does that actually mean? So yeah. we approached the group 
group um, who were like circulating there and, you know, talking between each other. And when we approached them, we did immediately sense a very off vibe and we just felt very uncomfortable approaching them because we just felt like something was going to go wrong. Mm. So I went up to the group, I introduced myself and I was very polite to them. I asked them, you know, how their day was going and they were nice to me, but in a kind, it felt very forced, very fake. Mm. Um, One of them complimented my dress but I didn't get any sense of a hostile vibe that was going to take place so after speaking to them for a few minutes I uh, I said to the group that I was from the RCY I was here to report on the trans safe resistance and to find out more about what they were doing so I asked if any of them would be interested in an interview at which Tim said he was willing to come on the you know do the interview so we take do the interview together he was telling me he was a non-binary person mm. and you know what trans rights meant to him what the day was about and then i got interrupted several times throughout the interview well, um, Anna, from we, oh we, yes we've got the video so let's just play that and people can watch it unfold so i'm here with tim so we're just asking like why are you here today what is the trans day of resistance hi so trans day of resistance is a little bit of an offshoot of trans day of remembrance which is on november the 20th uh basically we're not only just honoring the lives of uh, trans people in our community that have been lost but we're also trying to fight for their right to uh to be out in community for our right to be in community uh for our right for trans liberation uh yeah. okay point, um, so what enough. does what? yeah no, d- different group. What are you talking about? Right wing? This is where it oh. starts to... Mm. Oh, yeah, a little oh, hostile. The mood oh, starts okay, to turn. Okay, no problem. Um, so what does trans rights mean to you? Uh, well, I'm a proud non-binary person, and I guess trans rights <laughs> means just being able to, you know, come out here and proudly proclaim, you know, my name is Tim, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I want to be seen like that. I want to be acknowledged by that in, you know, in uh, at uni. I want to be acknowledged like that uh, at home, uh, at my workplace. Just, you know, I want to be who I am unapologetically and with no discriminatory practices put against me. I want to be able to, you know, seek any sort of gender affirmation that I want to be able to for free because that's, you know, that's a medical right. So on the Facebook group that was set up for this event, um, one of the principles that you advertised... I'm here in, like, I'm brand new, I start next week. I'm here literally just to cover it. I saw it last week. I'm not, it's no... I'm honestly just... So they're blocking the camera. Not edited. And you're over there talking to the group. And this this woman here, or person, I don't mean to misgender them, uh, this person here has come over and is just actively trying to make sure the camera can't see anything. Give them the time and energy. I didn't actually realise this was going on because I went over to talk to the group to see what was going on, what were they shouting about. And they went from being, you know, just to get nice to me, to swearing at me, um, you know, kicking off because they were seeming us the right wing media oh, okay. I'm, I'm I was there my, in I'm Bad Bay, my and so, they claimed that an earlier group had yeah, come yeah. to the okay, march no uh, like earlier that day and pretended to be nice when actually they were just there to report on the event so without asking me my opinion or knowing anything about me they immediately made an assumption and just started swearing at me getting increasingly hostile which is when my cameraman and I decided to leave Last time I checked, the entire point, the entire purpose of holding a protest or these sorts of highly visible events is to raise awareness and to get people talking about you. Uh, You've showed up to talk about them on the Aussie Wire and to give them exactly the thing that they want. So clearly the only people that they want to talk to are the people that are are sycophants. They're already on their side. Exactly. And if you're holding a protest, surely you should be able to have conversations with people who are going to disagree with you. And I think this is the problem that we have in modern day society, that we can't actually have a sensible or polite conversation about anything Mm. anymore. Mm. Um, I went there in good faith. I tried to talk to them very politely, very calmly about why they were there, trying to learn more about their opinions and what the whole ethos of the event was about. And just because they made one assumption on the basis of a good Google search of the Aussie wire. They did not want to talk to me. <laughs> and for a community that says they want their voice to be heard, they did not want their voice heard there. No, they certainly didn't. I mean, Tim, you know, seemed to be just simply talking and telling telling you what was going on and, and why they were there and, and why the group was there, etc. So that's all good. Uh, but the group as a whole, I mean, we, you chose to blur their faces. And I agree with that. We're not here to start a fight. We're not here to try and make anybody's life difficult. But it really seems counterproductive that we, we literally came there to give them exactly the thing that they say they want. 
uh, and that's how they responded to you. Well, Anna, thank you so much for going there. I'm glad you walked away unscathed. Um, there are some of the protests that happen, particularly in Sydney, is notorious for this, uh, where they can be quite unpleasant. And Chris DeBruin, a friend of the show, uh, at Chris Coveries, if you're interested in his work, if you're watching this, uh, he covers a lot of protests up there. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, things do go that extra step further. So it was good to see yourself and the camera uh, person get out of that situation without uh, any major drama. But Anna, Anna McGovern, Welcome to the Aussie Wire. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you on board, and I look forward to seeing what you can bring on social media, but also on screen for us going forward. Thank you. Well, yesterday morning, we saw some news come out of Canberra that has got me rather annoyed, more so even than usual when news comes out of Canberra. It's often annoying. This is frankly irritating. The news is that the government, the federal government, plans to go ahead with more water buybacks. These are the same water buybacks that have previously been done on the, under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and have been absolutely devastating for irrigation communities. The irrigation communities, for their part, have been begging the government to find different ways of achieving the objectives that they've set out to accomplish. But the government, and the Greens in particular, have done a deal with the government. They would have none of it, and they're going ahead with buybacks. To get some of the community reaction and to talk about what this means... I'm being joined by Lloyd Polkinghorn from the Bridge News. Lloyd, I wish we could meet under better circumstances, but nevertheless, thank you for coming on the Aussie Wire. G'day, Taifa. Thanks for having me. Mate, this has got to come as a bit of a body blow. Was it unexpected or was there already a sense that this is this was the likely outcome? Unfortunately, um, there was a bit of a sense that this was going to be the outcome. We, we've seen Minister Plibersek totally ignore our area, not visit the region, not see the impacts that have happened. You know, 83% of the previous water uh, recovered has come from the Southern Connected System. Mm. And, uh, yeah, she's been giving us a wide berth, so that was a real, real concern. Well, I began touching on this about uh, 10 years ago, and I was only able to do that because of the incredible research of people like yourself and others that you've been working with trying to raise the alarm. One of the things that concerns me is I don't think a lot of city, city people really understand just how serious something like irrigation water could be uh, for them. They'd see a headline like this and think, oh, it's, it's to do with the Murray-Darling Basin, the environment, it's all good, nothing to see here. What's, what's the reality of this? Help anyone who's not come across this topic before to understand what are the implications for Australia? Well, the implications are huge. Moving water from the productive sector not only impacts the price of food and food availability, but also on farm environments across our part of the basin. Mm. Um, quite a lot of areas that have been targeting water buybacks are historical irrigation areas. That's where water flowed already, and then it was regulated and metered and uh, on part of the floodplain. So we had bird life and uh, frogs and goannas and all manner of creatures that exist on these farms. Mm. And then we also apply water in a timely manner to produce food and fibre, you know, to feed and clothe people. Uh, really well-run systems, so they're historically gravity-fed systems. So in a time where we're worried about cost of energy and carbon, these were, were gravity-fed essentially from the source to the farm. Yeah. It's quite an astonishing thing, and, and it's one of those areas that took me a very long time to begin to get my head around, and we can only really touch on it very lightly here. I want to touch on two things that really got me fired up, and uh, I apologise, I'm going, to, I'm going to rant a little bit here, but this stuff really, really, frankly, pisses me off. Uh, this, is, this is an extract from the ABC's uh, coverage of this from, from yesterday morning. Uh, it says, uh, according to Senator Hanson Young, a South Australian senator, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan has not delivered what it promised to deliver. Now, of course, the plan was released, the draft plan was released in 2012 based on the Murray-Darling, uh, sorry, based on the Water Act of 2007. And I've got to say that, um, that Senator Hanson Young completely misunderstands the plan here because the Murray-Darling pa Basin Plan could not deliver what was promised. The, the means of action, the mechanisms, these water buybacks, removing water from productive use, could not accomplish the triple bottom line that was promised. Now, let's, let's cast our mind back. We were promised it was going to be good for farmers. We were promised it was going to be good for the, the communities in which the farmers lived and worked. And we were promised that it was going to be good for uh, the environment. Now, I happen to agree with Sen uh, Senator Hanson Young here that it has not delivered on those promises. What's the reality, Lloyd? What, what's the reality of those three triple bottom line outcomes that it was supposed to deliver on? What's actually happened? Uh, well, the basic plan has been a wrecking ball for our communities. We've got countless social and economic studies that have demonstrated, you know, the loss of jobs and industries and also the, the broader impacts to mental health and schools and footy clubs to communities that rely on irrigation. 
Now, at the heart of the plan, the Basin Plan is is identifying small sections of publicly owned environment to save mm. while discounting huge, huge portions of the Basin. We are a, a giant Basin and we all agree that it has to be healthy, but we have to look at it in a... Um, you know, in an integrated way. You can't just focus on recovering huge volumes of water without a plan on how to deliver it, where it's going, how mm. you get it there. Like we've already seen uh, the Murray here at Barham. We've lost 15 metres since 2012 of riverbank. So if we're actually talking about a plan to save the river, well, you go, well, hang on, something's a bit out of skew when we're actually destroying part of the environment mm-hmm. they're supposedly trying to save. Um, Senator Hanson Young actually talked about in the press release today that these changes are a huge win for South Australia. Mm. And she's talking about Coorong and the Lower Lakes and, and maintaining the Murray Mouth being open. Now, the MDBA already have 4,622 gigs of held environmental water. Mm-hmm. And so if we're not achieving those objectives already with the huge floods we've had, with the increased river flows and all that environmental water, well, adding more water is not going to help. If you're fighting the Southern Ocean and trying to maintain a a freshwater estuary um, and ignoring the science and history behind the the lower lakes and what's going on down there, Mm. you know, there's bigger things we have to look at than just buying water. Yeah, couldn't agree more. There's a second half to this comment here uh, that really speaks to what you've just commented on, the fact that they weren't measuring the environmental harms that came about because they were taking water away from on-farm environments. It says that since the $13 billion Murray-Darling Basin Plan was legislated in 2012, more than 2,100 gigalitres of water, and for city people, that's a pretty much unimaginable volume of water, more than 2,100 gigalitres of water each year has been allocated to the environment. And that, of course, is is uh, Orwellian newspeak. It's, a, it's an abuse of language, it was moved from one environment, that being the on-farm environment, into a different environment. And you could make the case that that's a good thing if you want to, but it's a very different thing and completely overlooks the incredible biodiversity that occurs in irrigation channels and and in in on-farm environments. What are you observing? A lot of channel systems have been shut down. A lot of a lot of farmers have moved on. A lot of farms have either been rationalised into big corporate farms, or in fact, a lot of land is actually just going back to being fallow. What are the, some of the environmental outcomes that you're observing in your community as a result of water being taken away? Well, when you dry out the environment, that has a huge impact. Northern Victoria just closed down almost two thousand kilometres of, of urban channels. Now. Mm. They're some of the best breeding, feeding and habitat wildlife corridors across that region. Mm. You know, it's a refuge for things to go and get a drink and also, you know, for ducks. New South Wales' latest um, duck survey, the highest number of black ducks are actually found on open-air channels. So, you know, when you're trying to talk about the environment, there's this, uh, it's a tapestry. You're you're looking at on-farm storages, you're looking at channels, you're looking Mm. at creeks and rivers. And things migrate between them. Um, as water left irrigation districts, you know, the, the huge ibis flocks that we get from the Kerrang Rookery, you know, you'd see them start to disappear because they once come and actually feed on irrigated pastures um, like dairy farms and mm. sheep farms, chase all the spiders and bugs as farmers were irrigating. And, and you remove that water and that has a, a knock-on effect. It's, yeah, everything is interlinked. Well, the federal government is actually claiming that irrigators are behind this move. And a little while ago, as they were sort of putting their ducks in a row, if I can use a duck analogy while we're talking about wildlife, uh, they they put the feelers out and they claim that more than double the required number of uh, the the required volume of water is being offered to them from farmers. Now, I know enough about this to know that uh, that farmers that get out early, the farmers that sell out are the ones that are least harmed. It's the ones that stay behind uh, that actually get devastated. And I've, I've got a bit of the work that I did in 2019, a bit of a video, if you'll, if you'll bear with me, Lloyd. It's about three minutes long. It'll be familiar to you. You've seen it. You're familiar with this one. But I know a lot of our viewers won't have seen the, the full 10-minute version that it originally was. And I think uh, while we're thinking about these farmers that are agreeing to sell their water, we need to think about the farmers that are left behind. And it's going to look a lot like this uh, video from 2019. I know city people now want to know where their food comes from but I don't think they really do want to know where their food comes from. They, they want a pretty picture, but I don't think they really want the true picture of, of the cost of, there's, there's one or two farmers every month committing suicide. Um, yeah, well, this is a really good farm and it's always, it's known to be one of the best farms in the district. The challenge is we can't afford, we can't afford the water um, at, the, at the current pricing. 
to put on the place to make it pay, you know, like. Uh, water security is what the backbone of the farm's based on. And when that's swept out from under our feet, it's very hard to have a business model that is successful. We have lost a, a 40 farms around here have sold their cows. Nearly every shop in the Kerrang and in Coon is for sale. So. Our local real estate agent, he, um, he goes, what do I do with these farmers? He said, this week I've had three farmers. He's saying to these people that are 50, 60 years old, um, your farm's worth $600,000. And they turn around and go, well, we owe the bank 700000 Like, they've actually ended up with nothing. They've busted their guts for, for 30 years for nothing. The first lot of temporary water I bought for this farm was $4 a meg. Um, this year, water got up to, you know, over $600 a meg. So the milk price is okay, but um, it doesn't cover those input costs. You know, currently, our cost of production is, is much higher than, than the income we're receiving for our milk. For how long we can do that, um, you know, it, it's something you can't do for very long. Oh well, it just depends when someone wants to to close the door on, on an account that we owe money on, you know, like it's, that's the reality. It can be tomorrow, I guess. It's sort of, you know, we got two young kids and it sort of puts a strain on your marriage and, and you know, you, you, you're wondering what you're doing it for and then you, you want to keep in it because you, you have to, really. Like we've, you've really got no, not many other choices. And um, we, we do like doing what we're doing, but you know, like after the last 12 months, there's a question there. It's, do we love it enough to keep going backwards with wondering about your future every day, wondering about where your kids are going to be, all that stuff? Imagine me passing on this debt to my children. Um, how are they going to farm with this sort of debt, with this pressure, with this unknowing whether they're going to get water or not, year upon year? Um, how one would wish that upon their children? You wouldn't wish your children. <coughs> you wouldn't wish to farm in this environment for your children. That's the reality of what happens when water prices go through the roof. Farmers go out of business. People lose everything. The banks foreclose, uh, and of course we lose the wisdom of multi-generational farming families. The younger generation, very understandably, either doesn't want to or simply can't uh, carry on that, that family legacy. So it's no wonder that uh, when the government comes along and says we're going to spend lots of money on water, there's a lot of farmers very quick to take them up on that offer, because if they don't, that's the situation they find themselves in. What's the mood amongst the farmers that you've spoken to in the community that you live in? Uh, is there a sense of despair? Is there a sense of hope? Is there a desire to fight back? What's what's the reaction? Uh, right. I think they're absolutely gutted. I mean, we had social and economic protections written into the plan because we'd seen the devastating impacts that water buybacks have. Mm. And we're just seeing the government throw those to the wind. I mean, the best farmers, in my opinion, are the multi-generational farmers because they're looking at a bigger picture. Yeah. They're farming for generations ahead. So they're considering environmental impacts mm. as well as being sustainable and being there in the long run. Um, one of the problems is that I see is when you see this contraction of, of family farmers and, and corporate, small corporate orientated farming get in, they are there sheer, for sheer profits. They actually don't care about the land as much. Mm. And, you know, I've witnessed that with some of the permanent plantings and, and problems around salinity and groundwater. They're things that you would never get away with as a, as a generational farmer. You, you couldn't take that approach if you were looking to farm for two, three, four generations in sure. the future. Um, the other thing we're seeing is that the cost of water, like water has exploded. Mm -hmm. When I first went home to the farm, it was like three, $400 a meg for permanent water, and, and that same water is now $1,800 a meg. Mm. You know, the price, the return of the commodities hasn't, uh, hasn't tracked that growth, and so, you, you know, you're being backed into a corner. And so for a, a young person to essentially go inherit or or come from some amazing job elsewhere to have the capital to uh, to enter the market. Mm. And the other thing that that story doesn't talk about is when they're flocked with people wanting to sell water, well, 
you know, farmers are only one one percentage of like a small percentage or a percentage of the water market now because we know that institutional investors make up quite sure. a significant number of water holdings. So when you see an article where, you know, irrigators are flocking to sell water, well, that could be, you know, foreign pension farms and mm-hmm. that could be someone sitting in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it may not necessarily be irrigators, but it'll be someone who's looking to capitalise on their returns. Only too happy to cash in on the misfortune of the of our farming communities, and uh, this is only going to make the, the the cost of living crisis worse. If you think the groceries are expensive now, uh, just give it another two years while these water backs uh, water buybacks unfold. Lloyd, I hope one day to be able to chat with you under uh, happier circumstances. I'm certainly going to continue this fight. I've been involved in it now for 10 years. I know that that's not a lot of time compared to some people who've been in it for you know, 70 years, their entire lives. But we need to keep fighting this. It's too important of an issue to let it go. Uh, I'm going to put some links into the description of this video. But before we wind up the interview, Lloyd, how can people find you and where can people find organisations that are helping to push back on this issue? Yeah, look, I really encourage people to get involved and actually follow some of the groups who are advocating for family farmers and their environment. Um, Speak Up for Water is a great one. You'll be able to find their Facebook page. Um, You can find I did a walk, 300-kilometre walk, to try and raise awareness of what was happening to family farmers. That's Lloyd's Walk for Water. Um, Yeah, so if you follow along, try and get involved. You know, there's a diverse range of issues across the basin. It's such a big basin and, and that's why it's important. I think these communities have a chance to have their say and, and fight for balance. That's all we want. We want a healthy, healthy balanced plan that's good for the people who live here and the environment we love. And, and yeah, we appreciate your work too, Tober. Uh, my pleasure, Lloyd, and I, I look forward to, you, to speaking to you again in future, hopefully, hopefully under happier circumstances. Thank you so much for coming on the Aussie Wire. Thanks, Tyler. Well, it's been a busy election season. Of course, Javier Millet just won the Libertarian candidate, just became the president or the president-elect of Argentina. He starts in early December. We just saw Git Wilders get up in uh, in Europe. And now we're going to cast our mind back about six weeks, ancient history, if you will, to the New Zealand election. You may remember we had Jonathan Kennelly on helping us to try and understand what was going on in our little brother, the easternmost states of Australia. And they're very different political system. I left that interview just about as confused as I came in. But one thing has become clear, that after six weeks of wrangling, New Zealand does once again have a government. And Jonathan Kennelly joins me to try and help me once again take two to try and wrap my mind around how you guys do politics across the ditch. How are you? Very good. Thank you, Christopher. Help me to understand what's happened here. There's been weeks and weeks of negotiation because there was no party with an outright majority. What's the conclusion to that been? The conclusion is what looks like to be a, a pretty solid, uh, stable, unified government of um, national New Zealand First and Act. Mm-hmm. And uh, really, they've come across as being, uh, they, they, none of them are regretting the six weeks that it's taken to get okay. through because they all seem very happy with what with the outcome. And to be honest, uh, I am too. And generally speaking, anyone who voted for those three parties seem to be pretty stoked, to be honest, just... Um, hearing people I don't know, hearing conversations in, in public places. Everyone's just rather pleased to have uh, competency uh, in general back in, in government. Well, it's an interesting situation in New Zealand. There was a time, we, we discussed this last time, there was a time not so long ago when New Zealand, the dollar actually reached parity with the Australian dollar and, and a lot of New Zealanders that had come to Australia for opportunity were actually moving back home. We saw that change quite a lot with the Labor Party come in. Of course, Jacinda Ardern became famous with her approach to COVID lockdowns, etc. But it wasn't just that. It was also economic management and other issues. Your inflation is relatively high and that's one of the things that that is, I'm told, sort of drove the swing back towards the National Party. To what degree do you think uh, economics and the economy kind of handed this win over? Almost 100%. Mm. Uh, in terms of the votes at National and ACT, uh, those two parties, it was economic. Uh, no two ways about it. It's just too obvious that it's, it kind of sucks uh, and we're heading in the, in the wrong direction. And so inflation's a part of that. You know, the, the cost of living is how they sort of, um, you know, mask the crisis that we're in, mm. but that is primarily uh, the fact that is inflation, isn't it? Uh, and then, of course, there's a, the smaller voter group um, who voted for New Zealand first. We didn't really get into last time. Mm. Um, and yes, same overlying uh, 
feeling of the economy and the country in general is just heading in a terrible direction. But that was more specifically around also um, freedoms that we had lost during the lockdown periods, during the the, uh, the pandemic period. Sure. Um, so that's sort of where that third party, New Zealand First, uh, comes into play as well. Mm. So you've got a new prime minister, uh, Winston Peter. Uh, Winston Peter's head of New Zealand First is the uh, the foreign minister, if I've uh, if I've read up correctly. And it's actually a shared deputy prime minister role between the leaders of the of ACT and uh, and New Zealand First. There, do you think that this is going to play out all the way through a term? We see in European countries where uh, similar to New Zealand, minority governments are, are you know are, are not uncommon occurrence. They can be very unstable. You've expressed optimism that this unity is this union is going to be stable. Do you think that will hold over the test of time? It would appear so. And I think there's a lot of faith amongst the voters of the three parties that that is so. You know, you can, uh, there are significant differences, but there's major overlaps Mm -hmm. between the three. Mm -hmm. And um, so they're all very intelligent individuals, which also, of course, as you know, and I both know, it leads to um, great propensity to clash <laughs> as well. But they're also intelligent enough to be pragmatic. Right. Um, so I've lost what your question again. No, that's right. Just in terms of going forward, obviously, stability is important. We want to see uh, if, if these people are actually going to do a good job. It's the same thing that I, I said about Javier Millet. I mean, is he going to have the support of his his own parliament to be able to ram through the reforms that he wants to push through? I mean, in this case, at least they've got a majority. It's a single house of parliament. They'll be able to do what they want as long as they stay united. But really, that that becomes the question. That's right. And I'll just clarify the deputy and prime minister. They're actually showing it a year and a half, and then in a year and a half, I think um, Seymour is taking the second half of the of the term, and mm. which I understand is uh, basically copied from the Irish um, right? parliamentary system. They, okay. they, they have a similar sort of. They also have minority parties, so it's not unprecedented. It's done before. They they've got a template to to work with. Mm. But yes, stability is a part of you know economic prosperity. So. Um, I don't have a problem at all in terms of these guys getting together. Um, They've all come out quite excited with Mm -hmm. what the wins that they've gotten. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't think there's no one's the the general feeling amongst the people that I've spoken to anyway, is that um, these are competent, competent men who um, know how to keep things under control. I was reading some reporting and trying to get my head around uh, around this new government and what the implications would be. Now, this is from Al Jazeera. It has to be taken with a grain of salt, of course, as all media does. Uh, but I did notice something that did strike a bit of a chord with me and, and cause a little bit of a cause for concern. I'm just going to read here. The Conservative National Party won over voters by promising relief for struggling middle-income New Zealanders. That usually means government spending, packages, those sorts of things. And to bring historically high inflation under control while reducing the country's debt. And I I can't help but think that those are three at least somewhat sort of exclusive objectives here. We're going to spend money on cost of living relief whilst bringing the debt under control. Well, spending drives inflation and spending drives the debt. What's what are we looking at here? Is this a misinterpretation of their policy platform or or are they really going to be trying to juggle all of those balls at once? That's uh, that looks like it's been written by someone from sort of uh, the opposite view who are trying to come across as being, um, you know, understanding and considerate. Really, again, I think the primary driving is just generally co- general competency. Mm. Definitely, they have, in terms of inflation, that has become the number one um, objective in terms of uh, the reserve, the, the central bank sort of um, what the targets that they're looking at. So, and in fact, that's at the expense of employment. So if employment goes up, that's no longer to be considered uh, as anywhere near as important as inflation. Yeah, right. So in, you know, in terms of the middle class, that, you know, that might actually end up being worse temporarily until the economy, the economy sort of catches up mm. and supplies those jobs. I mean, <laughs> I think that part of that was also that, that they got such ra- um massive cuts allocated towards government agencies. They are, have a promise to reduce um, the bureaucratic class back to the numbers that they were last time they were in government in 2017. And right. that's that's more than 16,000 jobs, which, yeah. you know, in New Zealand, that's quite a lot. That's quite a big number. Mm. That's 16,000 people who probably don't have any other useful skills. 
um, <laughs> back in on the un, uh, unemployment uh, lines. So uh, that's not really what I see them as having campaigned on in terms of um, here, here middle class have a bunch of free stuff mm. and it, it, it was really more this is a shit show let's um, get things under control and the number one thing being yes was inflation that I do agree with. Mm. Well it's interesting because Javier Millet in Argentina I, I did a special on him last week he's talking about stripping out entire government departments he's talking about dollarization in order to deal with inflation so a different a different means of, uh, of going about a similar objective dealing with inflation within the economy and allowing people to be able to have confidence in the currency and the money that they're that they're using um, and we're, we're seeing Git Wilders of course now there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of immigration aspects to Git's uh, platform in addition uh, but nevertheless, there are many of these sort of anti-red tape, anti-green tape, anti-inflation, let's let our farmers farm, let's let our, our manufacturers manufacture kind of a, a philosophy. Do you think we're seeing a, a more of a global shift as we've, we've had it so good for so long that we've become more and more left wing and more socialist? And now that maybe things are tightening up and maybe we're less confident in the future, is there a shift happening, do you think? Those policies are all very much reflective in this new government's uh, agreements and it's mm. a mix of all those three different parties it's quite remarkable actually if you see the agreements the things that the, those three parties have all been campaigning for have managed to get into the agreement those items you know let farmers farm mm. um red tape getting rid of those getting reducing the size of of the government and the and the uh, and the bureaucracy um that is basically a good summary of what this new government is coming to uh mm. is putting planning to put through so yes very much so i mean and long way at last, you know, the battles seem to, you know, are won and then they need to be rewon. And so let's not get complacent. Uh, but certainly that seems to, it just becomes too obvious. Eventually, the lies of and the nonsense mm. of the opposite side, you know, become too apparent because you have to live them, live the consequences of them. And then so, yes, naturally we have to swing back again. Mm. And then no doubt people forget about actually, you know, why everything's so rosy again mm. and they'll go trotting back up to the um, their old policies again. But, you know, for now it's, it's fantastic and it's, it does appear to be growingly universal in terms mm. of this uh, trend. Well, it's certainly very interesting coming from Australia where we do have a deepening cost of living crisis. And as of right now, I would say that for the most part, Australians are learning the wrong lessons from it. It's going to be very interesting to watch what happens across the ditch and then, of course, what happens across the South Pacific uh, to see what happens in Argentina. Because if uh, if New Zealand and Argentina can begin to set a bit of an example and, and maybe the Dutch along with that, uh, then we might be able to start to turn the argument here in Australia. So go well. We're, we're all barracking for you over here. Uh, and we'll touch base with you again in a couple of months' time and uh, and see if the country's still there and whether everything's imploded. Thank you so much for coming on the Aussie Wire. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching today's episode of the Aussie Wire News. We release new episodes every Tuesday and, and Thursday at 4 p.m. And all of our past episodes are available on our website, theaussiewire.com. Make sure while you're there, you read all of our blogs. And also don't forget to sign up to our email list so we can stay in touch with you, even if we do get deplatformed by big tech. While we're talking about big tech, you may as well follow us on all of our socials, at least for as long as they exist. It's at the Aussie Wire across all of the popular platforms and a few of the obscure ones as well. And don't forget that my first ever book, Good People Break Bad Laws is available right now for pre-sale, goodpeoplebreakbadlaws.com. And if you buy it now, you will get a signed copy. It's a great Christmas present or a great present to yourself. Thank you so much for your support. This is the Aussie Wire. I'm Topher Field. Thanks for watching.